Today's October 24th, 2011. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. And Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer at the History Center, is with me also today. We're honored to have with us Pete Mecca. Pete is a Vietnam War veteran, uh, served his country in Vietnam. He was in the Air Force and He's here to tell us his story in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, Pete, we're really honored to have you, and thank you so much for coming down here today. Thank you. Could you give us your complete name and current address? All right, Peter J. J. A. Y. Mecca, Jr. Where and when were you born? I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, January 15, 1947. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, my father was full-blood Italian. He was a World War II veteran. He fought in Burma. Um, my mother was a fiery Irish German. Uh, they raised me as a Lutheran all my life. Uh, my mother had a lot of respect for the law, a lot of respect for veterans, as did my father. Uh, my mother was always Christian in, in her attitude. She always said, son, you do turn the other cheek, but if they hit you again, you knock the son of a bitch out and then be Christian enough to call an ambulance. Okay. So um, I had a good upbringing. Uh, uh, they sent me to a Lutheran school my first six years. Then I went to public school, and uh, that was a shock after going to a, a church school. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't learn to fight until I got to the public school system. Um, maybe that prepared me for Vietnam. Who knows? But uh, then we uh, transferred from Memphis out to Bartlett High School because my parents built a new home in Raleigh. Tennessee. I went to Bartlett High School, Bartlett, Tennessee, and graduated from there in 1965. Okay. When did you go into the military? <clears throat> 1966. <clears throat> I went to uh, University of Tennessee Martin Branch for a year and a half after, after high school. <clears throat> and since it was on my parents' dime, uh, I could say I went to university and studied partying and fraternities and sororities and panty raids, if you remember what those oh, were. Yeah. And um, I just played around. I shot poo, played poker. I earned my pilot's license from my poker winnings. I learned to fly Cessna 150s and 172s. Uh, since my father was in the Army Air Force, I, I was always drawn to aviation. My uh, sister Mary Nell took me up when I was six years old in a Piper Cub. And I didn't want to come down. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with aviation then, still am. Um, so after a year and a half uh, on a four-point system, I think my grade average was something like point zero 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 one, and uh, I decided uh, I, to get out. I was not ready for college at that time. Uh, I went to join the Air Force in 66, and I went to basic, I believe, in December of 1966 to Lifeman Air Force Base. How did your family feel about you joining the service at that time? Proud and scared at the same time. So we knew the Vietnam War was heating up. I knew it was heating up. Uh, my dad always told me his stories about his activities in Burma, and uh, I figured it was my time to go. Uh, I had no qualms about going. I was not afraid to go. I was not afraid of going into the military. But of course, my entire family was worried about me because we already had some boys coming home uh, with the flag over them. So yeah. the, the fear was there. Yeah. Uh, I do remember, let's say, I went to BASIC in Lackland, Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas, in 66. Uh, in the Air Force, uh, a platoon is called a flight. It's not called a platoon. Uh, in BASIC, I did not consider it tough at all for military training. Uh, some buddies of mine, we ran the obstacle course and then laughed about it and ran it a second time. Uh, we got to the part of the confidence course, it's called, where some boys were hung up in the uh, part where you crawl on the barbed wire and little explosions go off next to you. I think that white smoke from the explosion was probably a Martha White baking powder or something. It, it, it was not scary at all, it was sort of like a cartoon. And we had to push some boys through who panicked. Uh, but we finished that and on the rifle range, uh, to get expert, you had to hit 59 out of 60, and I hit 60 out of 60, and I was the only one in the flight that got the expert marksmanship ribbon uh, in basic. Um, 
I remember one boy, I guess in, in the military, maybe in the, the platoons, the Army may call them the platoon idiot. Uh, we call ours the, the, the squadron duty bird. And one boy was beside me on the rifle range, and I remember he hit something like 10 out of 60. He never had held a weapon before, but the targets next to him had 80 out of 60 and 70 out of 60. He was shooting all over the place. So I said, dude, you're, you're just, you're all over the place. And he turned his weapon toward me and said, what? I said, carefully turn that weapon back around, and when he did it, it went off, okay? Uh, that, was, that was a little scary part in basic, but uh, he didn't get qualified. But uh, uh, basic was not hard for me. Uh, we only had to run a mile for our physical part. Uh, I had, of course, the National Fence Ribbon and Expert Marksmanship Ribbon when I left there. And when I say I left there, I left three weeks after my flight left there. Everybody got their orders after basic training was over, except for me. <clears throat> they told me after basic that you're not receiving your orders yet. Uh, you're to report to uh, the civil engineers. And I said, well, that's cool. I'm going to report to the civil engineers. And I'm going to be like an engineer. You know, I was 18-year-old and stupid. Uh, what I did for three weeks, the engineers did put me to work. I was busting up the, the concrete and asphalt on the roads around the base, okay? AWOL came to my mind, but uh, uh, I told my parents, I said, I don't know what's going on, okay? And my parents said, well, you just hang on. Something's going on, okay? Because uh, the FBI has been questioning the pastor, your neighbors, uh, your girlfriends, their parents, and uh, I think they've questioned your dog, too. Uh, my father was teasing about that, but he said, son, you hang in there. I said, okay. Uh, but I just, I was worried. So I went to the, uh, my drill instructor, Sergeant Enos, and I said, I don't know what they're doing, but I can tell you right now, I'm not going to stay in the Air Force if you put me into being a cook or some kind of laundry guy. I'm not going to do it. They just cut me over to the Army, and I'll go in the Army. And he said, I'll look into it. And he got me an appointment with the squadron commander, young captain. I told him the same thing, and he said, um, okay, I can just hang in there, and we'll see what we can do type thing. I didn't know it. Uh, the FBI was investigating my background so that I could uh, go into Air Force Intelligence. Uh, I had filled out some paperwork for RIA, that's Radio Intercept Analysis, where you'd fly along the Soviet Union at that time and intercept radio messages. And uh, I was qualified, but <clears throat> I had to fill out a thing if uh, you'd ever been arrested before. And some of my high school buddies and I uh, siphoned some gas one time. We got thrown juvenile court and our parents beat the hell out of us. But uh, that little brush in with the law, they said, there's no way you're going to get a top secret clearance. And they kicked me out of the class. And that really initiated my concerns. But I found out that I was going to get a top secret crypto clearance, which was the highest you could get. And they cleared me for that. And then I got my orders for AIT. And that was uh, air intelligence training. Okay. And then I was shipped off to Denver, Colorado, uh, to Lowry Air Force Base for AIT. Uh, very interesting. I loved it. Uh, we had 16 classes. They're called blocks. What surprised me first about Lowry Air Force Base was that I was said, oh, whoopee doo, you got a top secret crypto clearance, man. You're going to learn all these national secrets and good patriotic Americans there at that intelligence building. And the first day I walked in, there were officers there from Jordan. Uh, Egypt, Syria, uh, all through the Middle East. I might be wrong, but I think there were even some officers there from Israel. And they were in the hallways talking just like they were the best of buddies. And they were not in our classes. They had their own classes. But I was going, what's going on here? This is supposed to be an American intelligence school. But there were foreign officers there taking intelligence courses also. And I wasn't there but about a week. And we got up one morning, and the news was all over the radio. Uh, Israeli planes are attacking Cairo, okay? Uh, the Arabs are building up for combat. That was the Arab 1976 war, okay? And we got to class that morning, and all the officers from the Middle East were gone. They had packed their bags, gone to the airport, shaking hands, and they were either going in combat against each other or with mm -hmm. each other. And I just thought that was very unusual. Yeah. Uh, but once they were gone, we got down to the brass tacks of intelligence school. Uh, I held high score in uh, many of the blocks. 
identification of Soviet military equipment, airplanes, tanks. I knew a lot of that before I went in. Okay, I played with toy soldiers and airplanes long before you. Sh uh, much longer than most kids did. I just loved the military and everything about it, aviation. Uh, learned coordinates, learned how to pick out uh, boats versus an airplane, which some guys just didn't get the hang of. I remember one class we were, we did the photo interpretation, and they asked us what kind of aircraft is that down there. And you look down on your your uh, magnifying. Uh, dual magnifying glasses, and it was a little island about the size of an acre, and there were even planes in the water. Well, duh, that had to be a seaplane, a Soviet seaplane, and guys were putting down, it was a Bear bomber, F-15, uh, not F-15, but the uh, uh, MiG-15 fighters and everything else, and, and I don't think they made it through the class, but uh, I thought it was very interesting. I loved it. It was in Denver. We went uh, on our time off. We went snow skiing up in the Rockies. Um, I love the intelligence community, and the first thing they taught me was something I have remembered throughout the rest of my life. And especially after I'm writing now for newspapers, uh, they said, do not believe anything you read and only half of what you see. And if you live by that code, you will uh, end up doing okay in life. Uh, we were taught about the Gary Francis powers shooting down of his U-2. Uh, wasn't really shot down. Uh, the missile did not hit it. The MiGs didn't hit it. Uh, the two MiGs that went up after him, and this is no longer a secret, by the way, that's why I'm telling it. One of the MiGs got in the way of the other MiG when the MiG was going up because it couldn't reach out to. They were going up, and he fired his missiles at RU-2, and the other MiG got in the way and hit him. And the debris from that exploding MiG, one of the pieces pierced RU-2. And that's what brought down RU2. Uh, so you learn little secrets like that. But uh, uh, like I say, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, Denver was great. Now, when you were in Denver, was that 1967? That would have been 67 when okay. I got to, got okay. to Denver. Okay. okay. Uh, <clears throat> I did uh, after the school, and uh, we were I also took uh, civilian training as a, a jumper, a skydiver. Okay. And the day we were supposed to jump, the, the wind was too bad off the Rockies. And we were disappointed, but uh, I don't know if Paul and I were probably scared too. But uh, before we jumped, uh, we got our orders, okay? Uh, everybody was shipped out to pretty much where they wanted to go. The intelligence community uh, stuck together and tried to help you as much as possible, probably give you more training before you went to Nam. I did volunteer for Vietnam or Florida, and they sent me to Florida. I went down to the um, McCoy Air Force Base in Orlando, Florida. I forgot the designation for the SAC wing down there. Uh, I ended up drawing radar predictions for a B-52. To explain that, <clears throat> that was one of my duties in the intelligence community, to explain that B-52s normally flew at high altitude. The Soviet Union at that time didn't have the missiles to bring them down. When they developed the missiles finally to reach our B-52s, if they went into the Soviet Union, they had to go in at low altitude, about 800 feet off the deck. When a B-52 goes in at that altitude, the radar scope looks like a, a spaghetti farm, okay? It's just a mangle uh, of different reflections and shades, whereas high up, anybody can read a radar scope of training. That little dot's a city. That line is a river, okay? That big glow there is a power plant, whatever. It's pretty easy to read radar from high altitude. From low altitude, it takes special training and special uh, instructions. I had to go to the topography of a map and with special tools learn what the prediction would be, okay, and draw it. And because I did that, I was allowed to fly on the B-52 bombers for observation. There's a seat behind the pilot and co-pilot in a B-52. That's called the VIP seat. Now, I wasn't a VIP, but that was the only seat available. So during the takeoffs and, and missions and on the landings, I sat in the VIP seat. During the uh, bomb runs, the practice bomb runs, and to see how my radar predictions looked with the radar navigator, I had to climb down to where the radar navigator was and watch the, the scope during the missions, and uh, I was pretty much on course 
It was a pretty good job. Uh, because I drew the radar predictions and because I flew on the B-52s, I was also allowed to wear a flight jacket around base. And I had a lot of jealousy on that. I'll stop my officers and everything else and what are you doing with that on? And I had to explain what I did. That's my pride and joy. That's my picture All with right. a, a flight jacket, okay? Can That's you see good. it? That's good. Yeah. Okay. I can. All right. Uh, still have that flight jacket today, hmm. but I can't get into it. <laughs> this is my picture when I got out of basic with my national defense ribbon, okay? Okay. And the expert marksmanship ribbon. We want to see there. There we there go. go. Yeah. It's better to hide okay. my face anyway. Good. Okay. Yeah. And those, those are the two pictures of my uh, okay. uh, I loved flying on the B-52s. Uh, <clears throat> I remember the B-52s had what they're called packs on the engine. They had eight engines and 16 packs. If the packs did not work properly, that pilot would take off. And I remember we lost some packs coming in one time. And the B-52 hit hard, we blew tires out on the left side, we started veering off the runway, and I said, well, there is a letter going out to my parents, okay, but the tires on the right side blew, and it righted the B-52 back on the runway, so thank God. Yeah. Uh, that was the only scary part about flying yeah. on the B-52. Um, we did fly up to Canada on our missions. Uh, a lot of people may think that if the B-52s take off to bomb somewhere, especially so even that they fly across the Pacific or the Atlantic, and no way. The, we go over the North Pole, it's the shortest route. Soviets knew it, we knew it, and they always sent up MiGs to intercept us, and of course we never would penetrate the airspace. We didn't want to be front page news in the New York Times. Uh, it was usually cold up in Canada and around the North Pole. Uh, we would fly low at 800 feet off the deck, and uh, just the snow up there, it was beautiful in Canada, but I wouldn't want to crash there, okay? Uh, we would always fly back along the East Coast, and the Air Defense Command would scramble fighters to intercept us. They were practicing intercepting, and we were practicing dodging them. Uh, to show you how professional the pilots and the gunner, the tail gunner, and the rest of the guys were, they could look out and say, there's one at 12 o'clock, there's one at 6 o'clock, okay? In the many missions I flew, I never saw one fire. They were just too fast, I wasn't trained for it, but it was a thrill being an 18, 19 year old kid on those yeah. B-52s. Uh, the rest of my duties in intelligence, I was just shocked to find out that there was a big book there in intelligence. We had the names of the mayors of all the Soviet cities, we had their secretaries. We knew who was cheating on who. Uh, the Soviet bloc and the Iron Curtain was there. It was a secret society. But we had enough contacts to know what was going on. This country was better protected than the people ever knew about. And I was proud of that part. Uh, one part I'm not proud about is that we had access to a lot of different uh, materials and intelligence. And because I was underage, I made me a fake ID. So I could get in the bars, and uh, when I showed it to my buddy, he just laughed his head off because he didn't want to do a Florida or Georgia uh, fake driver's license because it was uh, they were too well known down there. So I did one from Nevada, and uh, I misspelled Nevada. <laughs> so it was, it was a waste of time, and everything. But really, the, there was a, a bar right off base, and they knew Air Force guys, and we never had trouble getting in. So yeah. it was good duty, Florida, you know, the beaches and things like yeah. that. But, I kept volunteering in Vietnam. I went through a couple of operational readiness inspections where you painted the garbage cans and you couldn't put trash in the garbage cans. And well, what are you supposed to do with putting your pocket? You know, we got people coming in to inspect us and everything else. But uh, that part of the military I didn't like. Uh, I did enjoy the uh, being intelligence, know what was going on, and if they would have let me fill in the B 52s, I would have stayed there forever. But my orders finally did come down for uh, Vietnam. but. Still not in country like I had wanted to do. My orders came down is for NKP Thailand. That is Nakhon Phnom Thailand. That is in the extreme northeast part of Thailand. It's about 30, 35 miles away from the North Vietnamese border. Uh, it's right across a thin, very thin stretch of Laos. And we were involved in interdicting Laos and Cambodian, uh, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail through those two countries. 
I remember getting to Bangkok, flying into Bangkok and thinking I had landed in Saigon. The first thing I saw in Bangkok were army tanks all over the place and soldiers all over the place, Oriental soldiers. And it was very materialistic, materialistic is that right? Yeah. Uh, in Bangkok at that time, a lot of coups going on and whatnot. But uh, I was really sort of shocked when I got to Bangkok anyway because I thought the whole country was gay because their soldiers would walk down the street holding hands with each other. And I found out that that is a Thai custom. If you're friends with a man, you hold his hand yeah. when you're walking or talking, okay? And uh, that's had to adapt to a different society. <laughs> uh, I love Thailand, I love the people. I learned how to speak that language. <clears throat> The only thing I learned in Vietnam was a Tole Ban Dung Nan, which means I am a friend and don't shoot. But in Thailand, I did learn a language. Uh, up in the Cone Phanom, when I first landed there, uh, I said my dad would have loved this. It was a drawback to World War II. The base was um, right in the middle of the jungle. It had the planking, the, iron, the metal planking, for a runway for a while. Uh, I looked around. There were no modern fighter jets there. The only jets there were a couple Lear jets. Uh, they were mostly the Sandys, the A1E Sky Raiders for interdiction of Ho Chi Minh Trail and for rescue and, and suppression. Uh, we had the Jolly Greens, the Hueys, and to my surprise, and, and uh, as an aviation buff, I was shocked and thrilled at the same time. We had the uh, B-26 from World War II, which was mm -hmm. called the A-26 with the eight machine guns in the nose, and I just love that aircraft, and it was great until the wings started falling off from fatigue. Uh, it had done its duty in World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam. Uh, the interdicting Ho Chi Minh Trail, I was also assigned to a place called The Project. Uh, that was a very top secret site there at the Cone You had to have top secret clearance just to get through the gates. Um, we, from there, we monitored the Ho Chi Minh Trail with uh, acoustic and seismic sensors. Uh, I did go on a couple of rescue missions. Uh, no one to rescue, someone else beat us to it. I went on a couple of forward air control missions. Never saw anything on the trail other than what they call buffalo chips, which is buffalo done, uh, water buffalo done. Uh, we lost a lot of people over the Ho Chi Minh Trail that wasn't reported uh, until the end of the war. That was the secret war, it was a covert operation. We worked with the Ravens, which was part of the CIA. We worked with Air, Air America, which was part of the CIA. Uh, the seismic sensors would, the vibration of the trucks, or feet, or water buffalo, we would know what that vibration was. Uh, the acoustic, we could hear voices. We could hear uh, a water buffalo bay, or we could hear Vietnamese talking. We could hear the trucks crank up. We could hear the clank of a uh, tank going down the trail. Uh, we did get a seismic sensor that was really acting up bad, and we could not figure out what in the world the vibration was or the sound was. And we sent an air commando uh, team in there. That was a 306 SOW wing, the Special Operations Wing, which was an air commando base in the Copenhagen. We sent air commandos in there, and from a hill with binoculars, they found out why that sensor was acting up. The North Vietnamese were not stupid. They knew about the sensors. They found one. Their trucks were just rolling by that sensor as their troops took turns urinating on the sensor. And that's how we found out what that strange noise was. Um, I was there for 18 months. Uh, I considered it good duty. Uh, I was over the trail a couple of times, landed once, but never was in danger, never got shot at, never had to fire a shot in anger. Uh, came home mentally and physically sound from that. Uh, went back to a secure base every night. Uh, we had a full-fledged casino <laughs> at the club. You could gamble, have a good time. There were pretty girls in town. Uh, I had a girlfriend I stayed with for 18 months because I was concerned about certain things, and she was too, so it worked out great for both of us. And my wife knows about it, so I'm not sure. telling anybody sure. anything uh, she doesn't know. Um, after 18 months, I finally got what I wanted. Uh, after interdicting Ho Chi Minh Trail for 18 months, I got my orders for Vietnam. So I went in country to Tonson Newt to the 406 Tac Recon Wing. Uh, 
I had two weeks at home before I went. My parents were upset that I volunteered for Vietnam, but I had already uh, lost a lot of friends, but uh, I just wanted to do that. That's where I felt I needed to be. I remember going back after my two-week leave and telling my girlfriend, Dim, that D-I-M, Dim, that, uh, uh, you know, that was it, and she knew it, and uh, I said that I'd be going to Vietnam. And she said, well, you know, go home. And I said, Dim, I've been gone for two weeks. You know that I went home to see my family. She said, no, you don't understand. You go Vietnam, you die. You know, go home. And uh, thank goodness that didn't come to pass. Yeah. But uh, huh. I remember that like it was yesterday. Yeah. Uh, enjoyed my tour in, in Thailand. Uh, when I got my orders. I was supposed to take a C-130 from the Koh Phanom into Tan Sanuk Air Force Base. <clears throat> I'd been up all night playing poker. <clears throat> Missed my flight. <laughs> C-130 was going down the runway when I got there. So the guy at the, uh, uh, the control tower just said, sit down. We'll have another one coming through this afternoon. Maybe we'll get you over there. I said, fine. So I was laid on my duffel bag hoping to get some rest and everything else. Well, the common, the general in charge of the project at, 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 at the Nakon Panom was Brigadier General Willie McBride, and he knew me. And lo and behold, here comes General McBride into the terminal. And I stood up, saluted, and he said, Mecca, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm going to Vietnam, sir, but I missed my flight. And he said, why? And I said, well, I was up all night playing poker. And he said, Mecca, I'm not talking about that. I said, why are you going to Vietnam? <laughs> uh, I said, I volunteered. And he said, well, don't you have folks back home? And I said, well, I I've already been home for two weeks to talk to him. And he said, where are you going to Nam? I said, uh, to Mac V, my military command assistance Vietnam at Tan Sin Luc in Saigon. He said, well, I'm on my way there. He said, you can ride with me. And I said, well, I appreciate that. Well, I'm thinking I'm going out to get on a C-130 or some kind of gooning bird, C-47, to fly to, uh, into the war zone. <clears throat> and I went, well, look here. I boarded General McBride's private Learjet, okay? <laughs> I was the only passenger. Uh, he had his wings, so he sat up with the pilot, and I guess he flew part of the flight over there. Uh, I said, well, this is pretty cool. I don't expect him to come back and babysit me, but I was wrong. Uh, General McBride was about 30 minutes left in the flight, which it was only about a 45 minute flight. Uh, he came back, sat down with me, and talked to me like he was my father. Right. He asked me what I was doing after the war, uh, how I enjoyed seeing my parents, uh, how I liked uh, working for him at uh, the Cone uh, how I liked intelligence, uh, what I was going to take in college when I got out, and uh, yeah, I remember that the rest of my life too. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, uh, he said, well, we're about to land, i got to get back up there. So we landed at Tan Sanut at about the same time the C-130 landed that I had missed. <laughs> And when I was debarking from the Learjet, some of the guys were getting off that I knew on at C-130. And they were looking over at me getting off that Learjet. And I saw the expression on their face. It looked like, who in the hell is that guy that flew in here with a one-star general? But that's how I got to Vietnam, on a personal uh, one-star general Learjet. When was this one? That was in 68. 69? 68. 68. Okay. No, you're wrong. Let me back up. That would have been 69. Okay, 69. I'm sorry. Okay. I got there in September of 69. I stayed there in September of okay. 70. Okay. okay. Uh, what was your first impression when you landed in Vietnam? I didn't have much impression. I, I flew in on a Learjet. It was just another big air base to me. Uh, no, a lot of military activity. Uh, I was picked up by a Jeep. Uh, taken right to intelligence building uh, at the 406 attack operations building. I uh, went right and talked to the colonel. Uh, he was having problems with the men that were planning and plotting the, the, air, the air wings missions. They were having tuning mistakes. Uh, pilots were going on the wrong coordinates and everything else. He said, Mecky, can you get this straight for me? And I said, yes, sir. I just want your pick of the, the young recruits coming in. And he let me do it. I got rid of every enlisted man in that uh, planning and plotting division. Uh, they were not showing up for work. They were staying downtown with their girlfriends. They were coming drunk and everything else. It was not a good scene. Uh, 
I got rid of every one of them, and I got the cream of the crop coming in from the states. Uh, a lot of the officers didn't like that because they wanted some good people for their sections, but I got first choice with the lieutenant colonel's help. And what was your rank at the time? Uh, I was a sergeant when okay. I was in there. Um, in the year that I was there, I trained these guys. A couple of them were college graduates. The rest of them were just sharp as tacks. One guy was not. I let him go somewhere else. Uh, in the year I was there, we had zero mistakes, none. And uh, we lost one pilot, but he was on a mission. He was supposed to be on. His plane just disintegrated. I still don't know why. I don't think they were recovered. I used to play basketball with him at the base gym, so that kind of hurt. But uh, I was proud of that record. Uh, I cannot brag too much about my activities in Vietnam, I felt I did more for the war effort interdicting Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, when I was in Tonson Loop, we dodged rockets and mortars a couple of times. I never came close to getting hit. I remember that uh, we had a little apartment in downtown Saigon. Sometimes we'd stay off base, and I remember one night, Ski and I were, one of my buddies was named Ski, we were on the patio drinking some beer. We were off duty, and we saw a red glow arcing in the sky. And it was a 122 millimeter rocket, head toward Tonson, hit the field up, okay, all kind of explosions. And I just sort of glanced over at Ski, we were in lawn chairs, and I said, well, sure as hell, isn't it? He said, yeah, give me another cold beer. So I don't brag too much about my duties in Vietnam. I do remember that uh, we were assigned to plan and plot the entire wing's missions for the Cambodian invasion in 1970. Uh, my men and I stayed up for uh, two days and two nights getting those missions right, plotting them out, and uh, when the troops went in, we went back to the safety of our barracks, but we didn't go to the barracks, we went straight to the club and tried to get 32 mixed drinks down us that were behind the bar, and it's embarrassing, but I don't know how I got there, I don't know where my men ended up, only one man showed up with me for work that night, and the only reason I showed up work was that I was stuck with a bayonet in my stomach, and I woke up, and I looked up, and it was slanted eyes, and I said, I'm dead. Okay, I didn't know where I was, but I said, I'm dead, okay? Um, and I looked around, and I was at the base garbage dump. Don't ask me how I got there. I don't know. It's embarrassing. I hope I'm not embarrassed in the United States military. But thank God it turned out to be a, a South Vietnamese soldier and a couple of his buddies who were just saying if I was alive. And they said, gee, are you okay? And I said, yeah, get me to work, okay? And they picked me up, threw me in a Jeep, and got me to work. Uh, Fred Wilkie was there. He was he was halfway sober. And uh, so he and I planned the missions that night. And how we did not make any mistakes is beyond me. But I always had this fear when I woke up and saw those slanted eyes, and I was being poked gently with a bayonet in my stomach, that my parents were going to see the letter from the, mil the, the U.S. government, Uncle Sam, saying, well, your son died heroically for his country in the Thompson garbage dump. Uh, you know, just, uh, you have to laugh about it. There's too many things that I don't want to remember and cry about. Yeah. Uh, I remember one thing that I was really embarrassed about when I graduated from basic. And I guess it's required in the military. They sent your little picture to the local paper. They put in there, uh, Pete Mecca, Aaron Mecca graduated from basic, blah, 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 and gave you a little write up, okay? And uh, they put it on the front page of the paper. And um, my mother was very proud of it. And when she sent me the paper, I went, oh, man, OK? I was in there, but right next to me in the paper was an article about a Marine Sergeant uh, Walter Singleton. He graduated a year before I did. And he had received the Medal of Honor but posthumously. He was killed mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And there I was in the paper right next to him. Yeah. And I felt lower than a snake's belly in a rabbit hole yeah. rut. I didn't like that at all. Uh, I certainly didn't want to share the front page with a man. Just one of Mel Bonner. Yeah. And his parents never would see him again. Uh, I remember Doug Ray's from high school. He joined the Marines. He was only over there about two or three weeks. Stepped on a landmine and lost his life. Um, I graduated with uh, Doug and, and knew his brother Mike very well and saw him after Vietnam. But... Uh, those are just moments that you don't want to remember yeah. too well. Uh, I make a lot of jokes about Vietnam and Thailand. 
uh, is because some of the things that, that I experienced or went through, I'd rather just not talk about. Yeah. Don't want to. Um, I was disappointed when I came home from Vietnam. I got out of the military. I knew I wanted to go back to college, uh, get my degree, and go back in as an officer. Okay. Um, the attitude of the home front was not really great when I came back. Um, I was called a baby killer a couple times. Um, I remember I got a part-time job when I got back to help get through college with the GI Bill. And one, two, two guys came in, sort of hippie type, and um, I was helping them and took off the guy's shoe to fit him with some dingo boots and a big old pack of marijuana fell out of his shoe. And he sort of laughed about it. He found out I just got back from Vietnam. He said, oh, how'd you enjoy killing all those babies? Jeez. And I had to hear that a couple of times from him. Uh, don't know the result of it, but uh, he went home with two left boots in his shoebox. <laughs> Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, except for my buddies who had been in Vietnam, I didn't talk to anybody about Vietnam. Didn't want to. Uh, it was useless, it was pointless, and uh, I kept everything inside me except with another veteran, and uh, that's the way it's been up until recently. Uh, where would you like to go from there? I want to go back to your time when you were in Vietnam. Go ahead. Did you have a lot of dealings with the Vietnamese civilians? No. Okay. okay. Uh, due to my security clearance, uh, I had volunteered as soon as I got there. Uh, for rescue missions or door gunner, anything they could utilize me for in my off-duty time. The captain in charge of my squadron refused it. Uh, he said, you're not going out there with that kind of security clearance. Uh, we don't need you shot down, and uh, you don't need to lose your life over here. And he gave me a couple books. One was called uh, Street Without Joy by Bernard Fogg. Uh, I read it. That was about the French experience in Indochina. And another one about the French Indochina experience, I forgot what it was, and the author. But I read both those books, and I understood the French got their ass kicked over there, and I pretty well understood we were getting our ass kicked too. Uh, we were in a losing proposition, but that still did not mean I, I didn't want to do my part and, and go on a rescue missions, door gunner, whatever they needed for me. Uh, I was one of the few guys that could squeeze off one round on an M60 machine gun. Uh, I was good at, at I was an expert marksman. I wanted to do my part. And after I read those books and talked to the captain, he pretty well talked me out of it. So that part I didn't get to do. Uh, I did not interact with the Vietnamese civilians very much. Uh, we did go up to Long Bend occasionally on, on classified map runs, and I was in charge of that with my dinky little 45 automatic, uh, which would not have been very good up against AK-47 or RPG. RPG. Um, uh, I interacted a lot more with the Thai people. I guess maybe just because it's more secure over there and everything mm -hmm. else. Of course, in Vietnam, you never knew who the enemy was. With the Thai civilians, what was their attitude towards us being in Vietnam and towards the American soldier and the American I government? never saw any kind of bad attitudes toward the Americans from the Thai people. Uh, if there was any kind of disagreement, it was like a boyfriend and girlfriend fight type thing. It wasn't a disagreement. Um, I liked the type of people. I, I would, could, I got on a um, motorcycle and it would run through the uh, back villages, you know, the little hills and things like that, and the, they were always accommodating. And because I put Thai in it, and I spoke Thai just a little bit, I could get along with them. They would serve me uh, cow pot moo, you know, rice and pork or whatever they had, uh, cow, cow pot moo, cow pot uh, rice and beef. Um, cow pot meal with, with rice and shrimp, they, they would accommodate you. Uh, didn't want you around the girls very much, yeah. but they were very friendly. You could go into a Buddhist temple over there and they would welcome you, uh, treat you with dignity and honor. Uh, I never had one problem with the Thai people. I don't think anybody I knew had a problem with the Thai people. Uh, in Vietnam, it was a little different. When I say that, the refugees were pouring into Saigon at that time. I was amazed to uh, get in one of those motorized sandlars, they called them, mm -hmm. and be putting down the street. Uh, and you look around, and there were houses just 
one after another like condos, but the houses were made out of beer cans. There was flattened Budweiser cans, flattened Slitz cans, flattened Carding Black Label, if you remember that beer. And usually they were all the same kind. The houses were different. There was a Budweiser house, Blue Ribbon house, but you know, uh, and whole families were living in these houses made out of flattened beer cans. They'd get them from the base. They were refugees, had no place to live. And you could have a family of five, six, seven, or ten living in a 10 by 10 house made out of beer cans with a dirt floor. Uh, that brought home the reality of war. And you question a lot of things when you're in Vietnam. I question even more when I was in, in Thailand interdicting Ho Chi Minh Trail. You sent out a flight of four F-4s to bomb a river ford made out of dirt, drop a quarter million dollars worth of ordnance on it. By the time the F-4s got back to Ubon or Ubon, uh, the, the North Vietnamese and their workers already got out in some more dirt and, and covered it up. Uh, it seemed a little fruitless. Uh, I know a lot of people can look at the uh, History Channel or the Military Channel or any kind of special about Vietnam and they're going to hear the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And they're going to see pictures of, of Vietnamese with their bicycles on the trail. It's a little path about like that. That's uh, Propaganda, as far as I'm concerned. There were a lot of little trails like that, especially when you got close to Vietnam, entering in Vietnam or entering out of Cambodia into Vietnam. It was more enclosed, more cover for the North Vietnamese then. But along the trail, the trail coming out of North Vietnam, it was some places two and three lane highways. It was dirt, but you could fit two Russian trucks on it side by side very easily. But it was dirt. We were bombing dirt. When you do that, it gets a little frustrating because at that time the Paul Dahmer Bridge in Hanoi and the Dragon, the Dragon Jaws Bridge further south was off limits. And it was carrying heavy traffic of trains and supplies and Chinese stuff coming in. And we couldn't touch that because it was off limits. So we were bombing dirt. Uh, we would also look for the uh, POL dumps, that's petroleum oil or lubricants. The North Vietnamese actually had an oil pipeline running from North Vietnam all the way to the south. It was made out of bamboo, but it worked. Okay, you can bomb bamboo and blow it up in splitters, then they chop up another piece of bamboo and get it running again. Uh, it was a high-tech war against a low-tech society. Uh, my theory as always was we should have troops along the trail, commandos or something, to interdict them, but that never took place until later in the war when they sent the Vietnamese in from uh, the north of South Vietnam and they got slaughtered. Yeah. Uh, the North Vietnamese were just too strong over there by the time we pulled out of Vietnam. Um, we looked for the truck parks. They would park their Russian trucks under the canopies. We called them truck parks. Uh, their biggest trick was to have a destroyed truck, damaged truck, and they'd stick the nose out just a little bit. And so our photo recon could see it. Or a maverick pilot would say, oop, there's a truck part, he'd, he'd drop some ordnance on it. Uh, and that was their decoy. There wasn't anything there, just junk. Mm -hmm. And the truck part may have been a half mile down the road with 50 or 100 trucks in it type thing. Um, some of these truck parks had movies for them. They had uh, their medical mash units set up, uh, they had uh, great hammocks to sleep in. These truck parks were huge in some areas. Finding them, boy, if we hit them, the explosion went off for two days type thing. But still more Russian trucks came down, still more troops came down. Uh, we were still fighting war with our hands tied behind our backs, and uh, Americans aren't built for that kind of war. Uh, we like to fight wars like uh, the Sunday football game. You go to the football game, you kick ass, and you go home. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're going to fight a protracted war, it better be right here on our own soil. We can fight that, but uh, uh, I, I got real frustrated yeah. going from Thailand to Vietnam. And uh, by the time I got out of Vietnam, I was pretty burned out, ready to go back to college and uh, sort of forget the military. For what was the morale of your troops like towards the end of your tour? In Vietnam, mm -hmm. in Thailand it was great, okay? In Vietnam, uh, 
there was a little frustration among the troops. The men under my control, under my supervision, uh, they had high spirits. I kept them pumped up. Uh, yeah, we parted sometimes. Uh, we did get hammered after the Cambodian invasion, but we were very dedicated to what we did. Uh, I would not allow anybody not to show up for work, to show up drunk, except after the Cambodian invasion. Uh, they did not say, well, I was down, my girlfriend didn't wake up. Uh, none of that happened while I was there. I kept them pumped up. We had a little apartment downtown that we could go to to get away from the base. Uh, during a rock and mortar attack, we just put our flak vests and our helmets on stayed, stayed at work. We didn't hit the bunkers or anything. Uh, I remember one time <laughs> um, we got hit when I was in the barracks. And uh, I grabbed my M16, went to the bunker, and I was the only one that grabbed uh, an M16. But that's how well trained we were for yeah. combat in the Air Force. <laughs> uh, I remember one guy, Louie, a um, little bit different story, but Louie and I would go round and round about religion. He did. He was an atheist, although he was raised a Catholic, he was an atheist, and I was a Lutheran, and uh, we argued a little bit about God, and, and mm -hmm. he said, well, I said, Louie, what happens if you get up there and you found out, oh, there is a God, and he just said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't know, <laughs> uh, and that, I said, Louie, that's not going to work. Well, we were hit one night, and we all ran to the bunker, and uh, we had somebody mumbling in the background, and a couple of 122s came fairly close, just enough to scare us. And we heard some mumbling in the, in, in the back of the bunker. And as our eyes adjusted, I looked back there and I just smiled. It was Louie, and he had his rosary in his hands. Mm -hmm. And he was going, Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail Mary, full of grace. Mm -hmm. He was scared to death, and he finally decided that though there were no atheists and fox holes. Yeah. He was going to pray yeah. that night. Good. And the next day when he came into work, I glanced at him, and he said, I'm just covering my bases. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, that was just one of the, the, the funny episodes, yeah. I guess. You remember things that you start talking about them. But the morale among my troops were good. I know, I know that was, Ted had already happened. Uh, anybody with any sense knew that uh, the politics of the Vietnam War was going against us. The home front was turning against us. Uh, our boys never lost a major battle over there, but our politicians lost the war. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, I am not, never have been ashamed of my duty during the Vietnam War. <clears throat> I'm proud of it, proud of my country, proud of my flag. I still believe in our system of government. Don't like the government sometimes, but I believe in my country and I always will. And Vietnam did not change that. It did not change the guys I was with. I know of some boys from high school especially that came home and they were pretty screwed up. Mm -hmm. uh, some came home without eyes. Some came home without arm or leg. Some came home mentally scarred, a couple came home on drugs, they fought that for a lot of years, but I know them to this day, and they are married, good family men, and doing the best they can. Uh, I know that World War II, Korea, they came home and didn't get very much help so far as uh, combat fatigue, shell shock, whatever you want to call it back then. Uh, ours eventually became post-traumatic stress disorder but a lot of our guys that needed help didn't get help until almost too late in life. Uh, the young men and women now in Iraq and Afghanistan, at least it's recognized and they get a lot more help than we did. And thank God they're doing that and thank God for these troops and thank God for our American citizens now who have matured to realize that it's not the military that, mm -hmm. that, that make the policy. Yeah. We just go do a job. Right. And the young men and women coming back now uh, in an airport, they can get, still get a standing ovation. Yeah. Uh, they're not called names or insulted in airports like we were. Uh, and it's because of these kids and their dedication and their professionalism that now people want to hear from the World War II veterans and the Korean veterans. And as this interview uh, uh, testifies to, Vietnam veterans are finally speaking out. Mm -hmm. And we need to speak out. Uh, we need our story told just like all veteran stories need to be told because somewhere down the road somebody's going to twist history once again mm -hmm. and claim that we actually bombed Pearl Harbor or we invaded North Vietnam or something yeah. to twist the truth and, and I, I thank God that you guys and some other people are doing this so that our stories can be recorded. But before we go to your post-Vietnam activity 
activities and experiences. Sure. What unit were you in uh, when you were in Vietnam? What was the designation? Vietnam was the 406th. I'm sorry, let's back up. The 460th. Okay. TAC Recon. Okay, okay. Okay. And tell us a little bit about what you did after you re returned to the United States and then after you got out of the <clears throat> military. Got a part-time job, got the GI Bill, and I went back to college at Memphis State University, which is now Memphis University. Um, they, I got with the uh, uh, counselor and we looked at my grades from University of Tennessee, Mark Branch, before I went to the military, and she just spoke the truth. She said, son, you need to start over, <laughs> which I did. My grade point ever was so low. And um, I finished college in two and a half years. Uh, I was more matured. I went from a little boy to a man. And uh, I made, uh, my degree was in a BA degree in political science and public administration with a minor in history, including military history. Uh, I had no trouble in college. I was on the dean's list several times. Uh, several professors wanted me to go to, uh, to earn a master's degree. Uh, I chose to do something else. I um, did not have too many run-ins with uh, students being a Vietnam veteran, but I did have a run-in with a college professor who, he was my English professor, he called me a baby cutter once. And some of the students grabbed me to hold me back. And we also had an argument one time because we had in our literature a poem called Flight Line. It was about a young ground crewman in World War II that wrote a poem about a B-29 taxiing down the runway. Very simple poem. <clears throat> and this college professor said, well, what was a B-29? And I explained to him what a B-29 was. I said, that's a four-engine bomber for World War II, Stratoforce. And Here's the one that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. He said, no, 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 no. That was a B-52. And I said, no, it was a B-29. And he got upset because I disagreed with him. And there again, we went at it. We called each other names. And he was adamant there was a B-52. And I said, we didn't even have jet bombers in World War II. We didn't have jet fighters in World War II. But uh, very hard-headed. And uh, that's really the only problems I yeah. had. Was one very very liberal college professor who yeah. couldn't be told nothing. Yeah. yeah, I didn't make a good grade in that class. <laughs> I had a C plus, and that was the worst grade I made in college after I got back. But uh, I did try to go into the military after I graduated. <clears throat> I went back to the Air Force with all my uh, talents, requirements, service to the country, and uh, I took my physical, took my written test, and. The recruiter said, son, I wish you'd fail one of your tests because I can't get you in. And I said, well, what are you talking about? This was 1973. And uh, I will mention this because it deserves to be mentioned. Uh, he said, I will show you. Don't you say one word. And that was in Memphis. He picked up the phone, called the headquarters for the recruiting for Air Force in Nashville, and said, Captain, I have another recruit. I have another candidate for OCS. And the uh, captain said, is he black? Okay. And I went, whoa. Okay. Hmm. At that time, the recruiters were told did not accept anybody for officer candidate school unless they qualified to be a pilot. I was not because I had a vision problem in the right eye. And they had such a push on for equal opportunity mm -hmm. and to get some black candidates in, in the officer court at that time. Uh, I couldn't get in because of the color of my skin. So it goes back to, yeah. to understanding what it was like for the Montford Point Marines, who were Marine, black Marines in World War II, yeah. what they went through, yeah. uh, what they went through in Korea, and they fought their ways into the officer corps. They fought their ways into the higher ranks, ranks like Colin Powell, and uh, uh, the people of color. One thing I learned in Vietnam, okay, and in <clears throat> the war zone, was it, it didn't matter if you were lily white or charcoal black or Asian yellow, Navajo red uh, uh, or, or chestnut brown. Mm -hmm. When you got hit, you bled the same colored blood over there. Okay, so that was a growing up for a lot of white kids and for a lot of black kids over there. Uh, we came back with a different attitude, at least I did, about mm -hmm. race and, and what this country should be about. But I felt the pain of discrimination from my own yeah. government mm -hmm. because of the color of my skin. And it hurt. So I was in somebody else's boots. Yeah. And I didn't like it. Yeah. Uh, 
So there you got that story. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and from there, I went into uh, um, transportation management for a lot of years. Uh, have always loved to write. Uh, always wrote the wrong stories. Always wrote the wrong subject. And uh, in the past two years, I've been uh, writing for two newspapers with an article called A Veteran Story. I uh, got my first book to be finished by the end of this year. I think we can call it uh, Veterans Voices. And it's just about veterans, just like me, like you, like everybody else we talk to. Uh, from World War II to, to Afghan and Iraq. Uh, I tell it like it is, but it's a veteran story, it's not my story. And I don't put any punches with it. Uh, heavily edited sometimes by the newspapers. I've learned a lot about, don't believe anything you read, <laughs> if you remember that. Um, but I enjoy that. I enjoy working with my veterans, and thank God that we're starting to speak out now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm part of that, so that's what I'm proud of. Maybe this is what I've, the good Lord spared me for to do later in life, so that's what I'm doing. Well, we're glad you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Tony, do you have any questions? I, I want to give you one last opportunity to say anything you want to say, either to fill in any blanks in the story you just told or deliver any message you want to deliver to people who are going to watch this in the immediate future or down the road. Down the road, I just want people to remember that the Men and women in Vietnam, we just went there and did a job. We did what we were told to do. We did it to the best of our abilities. We did it under some extremely hard circumstances and situations, but we didn't falter. We won every battle. We lost a battle in Washington, D.C., uh, but the troops took the blunt of the criticism when we got home. Our nation was split. We do not need this nation to be split anymore over war or over defending our country. Uh, we were basically involved in someone else's civil war. Uh, the Viet Vietnamese have not expanded their sphere of influence after South Vietnam fell. Uh, we sort of knew that early on in the war. McNamara told President Johnson in 1967, uh, we're not going to come out good on this deal. We can't win it. And yet American troops were still dying. That is really a travesty. It, it, it was a, a ridiculous type situation. If you know you're in a bad situation in a combat zone or in a war, get your troops out of there. Okay? Don't worry about saving face. You need to start saving lives. And I want everybody to understand that if somebody's wearing a uniform, say thank you. Because you don't have to put it on. You don't have to go over there. You don't have to do the dirty work. You still have the freedom to do what you want, to be what you want. And as one of my World War II veterans said, freedom also means you have the freedom to show how ignorant you are. Okay? Know what you're talking about with a veteran. Know what you're talking about when you talk about the military and a war. But also, if you see somebody in uniform, don't criticize. Say thank you. That's all they need and that's all they want. Well, that's a wonderful message. And I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in here and telling us about your experiences and allowing us to record your story that will now live on in history. And uh, thank you so much for what you did for your country. And uh, you made it sound like you didn't do much, but you did because you probably saved lives every day with those pilots flying, <coughs> flying those missions. So you accomplished a lot every time you planned one of those missions. And well, I'm going to add one thing. When I was leaving Vietnam and my military career for four years was over, uh, they said, you're going to get the Bronze Star. And wow. be on the field tomorrow afternoon, blah, blah, blah. I said, nope, not going to be there. They said, well, you will be there. I did not show up. Uh, a lieutenant had to come in and slam my medal in front of me for me to accept it. And Lieutenant Colonel, he was upset at me. He said, let me hear your excuse. I had too many buddies who didn't get any medals and awards, and they came back wounded, hurt. A lot of them didn't come back except with the American flag over the casket. I really didn't want any medals or anything for what I did. I volunteered to stay there because I wanted to. Now, had I done something super heroic, yeah, I would pin a medal on the type thing. But just to be there and, and just do my part, I. I 
I was going to feel embarrassed to stand in front of a couple hundred people and get a little medal. I didn't want to do it, and I didn't do it. It was handed to me on the desk. Well, that's an honorable attitude, but, <laughs> but I, I know you earned that recognition, right. and uh, I know one way or the other you're proud of it, and you should be proud of your service because you served served the country well, and we, right. we thank you. All right, thank you guys for your service, too. Thank you.